what an invitation from the Lord. That's what Christmas is all about, you know, an invitation from the Lord. What a wonderful invitation it is. Yeah, oh, come, let us adore him. What an invitation. Come with me, let us adore him, Christ the Lord, for, he's, for he alone is worthy. Who else could be worshiped like Christ? Nobody deserves the worship and the adoration and the praise and the glory more than Jesus, more than God stepping out of heaven and coming to earth as an invitation from heaven. You know, Jesus is not an intruder come down to marshal earth or to take earth or to belittle earth. Jesus came as an invitation from God. Come come join him. Come come be with him. Come and see. Come come behold him. Don't be afraid, he said to the shepherds. Don't don't be afraid of that. Yeah, it's Jesus. Yeah, our Messiah, our King, come to let us adore Him. I always am enamored uh, with the Gospels, especially during the Christmas season, because I know as you read the Gospels, you 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 see Jesus being born. You see all the uh, all the all the uh, decisions and all the instruments that surround the birth of Jesus. We have what we call four Gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And I don't want to put any, put a lot of theology, all right? Because when I say the word, some of you might groan, oh, no, not that. No, but just a little tiny concept here. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are called the gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels. Sin meaning similar or like, optic dealing with to see. The synoptic gospels see the life of Jesus alike. They present it alike, although they have a little bit different point of view and God speaks to them in a little bit different ways about how to present some of the issues and some present uh, material, others don't, and so forth. And there's all a purpose for that. But John, John, even though he's called a gospel, he's not a synoptic gospel because God, John doesn't carry his message like Matthew, Mark, and Luke carry the message. John carries the message using basically seven tremendous miracles that Jesus did while he was here on the earth. And the purpose, John tells us for his gospels, that you might believe that he is the Son of God and believing you might have life through his name. And so Matthew and Luke go, go back to the birth of Jesus, to the cattle, to the shepherds in the field, to the stars in the skies, to the great announcement, to the angelic rejoicing and the shepherds and all of the uh, implements around the birth and the manger and the cradle and all of those things. And John goes way back. <laughs> John goes back, as a matter of fact, to the beginning. And look at what John says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus was in heaven. Jesus lived in heaven. When God, in the book of Genesis, began to create man, he said, let us make man in our own image. Who is us? There's nobody there but God. Well, he's the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So obviously there was a reason why the Word had to leave heaven and become flesh on this earth. I know at Christmas time, lots of people present the, 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 the gospel, the ministry of Jesus, as if somehow God misplanned everything, and, and, and Christmas is an accident. But I, I want you to know that before the foundations of the world were even laid, Jesus had already been crucified for our sin. Look at your neighbor and say, he was there all the time. He was there all the time. He is the lamb that is slain according to the word of God before the foundations of the world. So before the word even spoke the world into existence, the world that he spoke into existence was not even created by the word that he would speak. Isn't that mind-boggling? And the Word stepped out of heaven and stepped on an earth, stepped on something that He created Himself in order to accomplish God's purpose, which was what? That you and I might have salvation. That you and I might have an opportunity to hold the glory of God in earthen vessels. I love what Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 4. He says, 
And we hold this glory in earthen vessels so that the power of God might be displayed as to how powerful it is, how wonderful it is. And so God did all that he did so that we could do what we do, so that we could receive this. It's an invitation from the Lord, receive me. God had a plan that followed a pattern. God was not caught by surprise. God did not just wake up one day and say, oh my goodness, all my plans have failed. I guess I'll have to send Jesus. No, before the foundations of the world, God already had a plan. God already had put his plan in action. And he spoke to a man by the name of Abraham. And he said, Abraham, get out of there and go where I'll lead you. And that was the start of a great covenant that God made with his people. And then God continued with Moses. And he said, Moses, go down. And I'm going to write my laws on some on tablets of stone. And you tell them, follow the law. But we couldn't follow the law. So God called another, David, a man, he says, that's after his own heart. And David was a praiser. David was a worshiper of God. But that could only take us so far. And then God spoke to prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, five majors, uh, 12 minors, and all of those in between. And, and they said, you know, make straight the path of the Lord. One of these days, God's going to send a great Messiah, and he's going to grow up like a root out of dry ground. And it began to describe everything about him. But still, there was no completion until finally one day, the Word of God was with God, and the Word was God. That He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. Look at your neighbor and say, He created everything. Yeah, He created everything. He's there. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In other words, a better thought about that was the, the darkness did not take it in. He came as the light, but the darkness did not receive the light. It didn't take the light in. It tried to reject the light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And that's why no matter where, the, where you go throughout the whole earth, you'll find people worshiping something. Wherever you go to the darkest part of the earth, to the most cultured part of the earth, and all of those in between, everybody worships something. Why? Why? Because every one of us are born with a little bit of light on the inside of us. Jesus is the light that lights how many men? Every man that comes into this world. So no matter if you're born in the darkest of places, there's something on the inside of you that tells you there's something greater than you. There's a light that has been birthed on the inside of you that says, worship something greater. And so they may, it may be a crocodile, it may be a rock, it may be a statue, it may be some mountaintop, but, but you're going to be worshiping something. Why? Because Jesus lights all of us and gives us an understanding or gives us a, 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 a draw towards something that is greater than us. The Word made flesh draws us and empowers us and invites us to come and be a part of what God is doing. And he does it to every man of the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. I imagine this, and imagine it with me, that somehow you created something. Let's just say your home. I mean, I know there are lots of ways you could mess this analogy up, but, but, but just think about the uniqueness of your home that you created, that, that you pay for, that you've kept together, that you repair and do all the work and you make it run and make it function and imagine yourself going to the door of your own home and knocking on the door and the family be on the inside, but they wouldn't open the door and let you in. You weren't welcomed in your own home. They didn't want you in a place where you created. And, and, the, and, and the word says, and Jesus came to his own. And when he got here, he, he wasn't welcomed by his own. 
But he came anyway, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of, of man, but of God. And look at this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the word stepped out of heaven and came down to earth and lived here on earth. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth and full of grace. He's God's only begotten Son. I know there are religions around the world that say that Jesus is just one of God's sons, that Jesus has brothers, and these brothers have different uh, directions that they've taken and Jesus took our direction, and Lucifer, they say, is a brother of Jesus. It's ridiculous. The Bible says he is of the only. What does only mean? It means you, you're by yourself, right? The only begotten. Just three chapters later, John will give us the greatest word about this that all, any of us have ever received. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son. Begotten means birth naturally. He has a bunch of sons. Yeah, you and I are sons of God because when Christ comes to live on the inside of us, we're adopted into the family. We're adopted sons, not begotten sons. But he has one begotten son. And, and Jesus comes and Jesus dwells here on earth. The question becomes, how will God step into this world? How will he present himself into this world? There's lots of expectations. The expectations of those who Jesus came to originally were that he would step in as a, as a president, that he would become a mighty conquering president and that he might just manifest himself sitting in some seat of leadership somewhere that he was a potentate, that he might, he might be a king that would sit on a throne and straighten out everything that was wrong in the, in the country and keep us from being harassed and maligned. And, and even though we're a minority class of people, we're expecting a conqueror and a hero and a general that will come and spoil the leadership and keep us from being harassed every day. These is, this is what they expected. But according to the Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke, this is not what Jesus did at all. I know you know why he had to come like he did. Well, last Sunday, I shared with you the, the, the reason why he had to come this way. And the reason he had to come this way is because he had to have a dirt body. Look at your neighbor and say, he had to have a body. Yeah, he had to have a body. And that body had to be made like our body in order to be legal in this world, to have dominion over this world, according to Genesis chapter 1. You know, get that message. You can hear all that. But the point is that he came and he had to come. And in order for the word to become flesh and dwell among us, he had to live on this earth. And here's what the gospels say happened. And in those days, and, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. All the world's got to pay some taxes. You got to go. This census first took place while Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone into his own city. That's mighty convenient, isn't it? Everybody say um, anonymous. This is God's way of remaining anonymous. This is a coincidence, you say. <laughs> Yeah, the fact that everybody was drawn back to the place of their birth, the place of their family's birth, and that that would mean that Joseph and Mary would have to go back to a little town called Bethlehem because they were of the house and the lineage of David, the, the shepherd of Bethlehem who became king. Coincidental. Let me just, I know you've heard this before, but just say it to you that coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And they were all on their way back. I think it's a master plan, as a matter of fact. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed. Uh-oh. <laughs> 
his betrothed wife. Yeah, you mean they weren't married yet? Well, of course, that's what I mean. They were just engaged. And I know the cultures are different, and I'm not promoting people not getting married. Obviously, I'm not. But I'm just showing you that lots of times we can get all captured up in the process of things and miss the blessing of it. And here is, G here is Joseph who has never been engaged with Mary in his life. He's never had any relations with her. And she is yet pregnant with, with a child. And they're on their way to Bethlehem because that's where they have to go to register for the census. And she has in the inside of her a seed in her virgin womb that has been placed there by the Spirit of God. And that seed inside her is going to become the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And, 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 and so who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, common clothes, everyday clothes, not in royal purple, not in kingly uh, gold and, and pomp and stance. And I mean, it, it, she wrapped him in something that was so common that you might even miss it if you're not looking for it. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and, because, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And now God says, I've got to announce this to the world. So who is God going to use to announce to the world that the word has been made flesh and stepped out of heaven and come to dwell with us on earth? What is Christmas all about? Is Christmas about a conquering hero? Is Christmas for the ups, the elites, the powerful, the, the bold? Who is Christmas for? Well, God said, we've got to announce Christmas through a unique people, and God chose the, one of the lowest classes of people on the face of this earth. God says, let's let the shepherds do it. The shepherds were a lowly lot of people. Think about it. The only people they ever hung around with were other shepherds. Why? They worked all the time. They had to be out in their fields all the time. They couldn't punch a clock at 5 o'clock and then say, okay, I'll see you sheep do the best you can overnight. <laughs> I got a date tonight. Got to want to go to a nice restaurant, take her out, because I, I think she may be the one. Uh, you sheep, get, get along the best you can. No, they had to stay with the sheep. So they were the outcasts. They were the low life. They were the, they were the ones that smelled bad and looked bad and were the most common of people. On the, I, I just think it's interesting that when God set to announce the glorious birth of God in the flesh stepping out of heaven down on the earth, that he chose the most common of people that he possibly could have chosen. He couldn't have chosen a lower bunch of people to say to us, <laughs> no matter who you are, he came for you. Yeah. And so he says, we'll tell the shepherds. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were greatly afraid. That old word, sore afraid. Yeah, you can't forget that. And every time heaven appears to anybody on earth, they're greatly afraid. Have you ever noticed that? Every time you read in the Bible that an angel appears to anybody, what is the very next word? Don't be afraid. They pass out or something. It says, and he touched them and he lifts them. And he, Don't be afraid. So it's an overwhelming thing. And for there is born, uh, 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 for behold, I will bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Who's invited? All people. What, red and yellow, black and white? Now, of course, just saying that might be a microaggression nowadays, but, but you know what I'm saying. Everybody, all races, all classes of people. He's come and he's inviting everybody. You're invited that... That, that this is something that has come to all people. For there is born to you, and 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 you, and you, as born to you. Have you got your invitation yet? There's born to you in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
And this shall be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in these common swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Of course, Jesus didn't stay an infant. He grew up. Eight days later, he goes, he, he goes in for a special ceremony that the Jews have of male babies that they have to be circumcised on the eighth day. So Jesus is in the temple as a little infant on the eighth day, and they circumcise him and do all of the ritualistic stuff that it takes to, to, to complete the Jewish law with a, with a baby boy. And then Simeon, an older, an older man who has been promised by God that he'll not die until he sees the Lord's Christ sings and rejoices over Jesus and prophesies over Jesus. And then Anna, an 84-year-old prophetess, picks up the refrain and has great words of prophecy about the rise and the fall of Israel and all that kind of stuff. And, and the Bible says, so when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee in their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Jesus grew up like every other child grew up. Jesus played games. Jesus played with his brothers. How would you like to be a brother of Jesus? Pick me, Jesus. Jesus' team always wins. <laughs> Jesus throws the ball so fast nobody can see it. Except him, and he's the only one that can hit a pitch that he throws. Yeah, he wins every game that he plays. No, I, you know, I, I don't know. All I know is that he grew up like a normal human being. He was a child, and he grew up like a child. And the Bible says that he was filled with wisdom, and the Spirit filled his life, and he grew up like a normal man. And when he was 30 years old, he began a ministry on earth to take the good news to everybody that lived on the earth. And he waited till 30 because this was what the Jewish uh, law said, that you had to wait until you were 30 years old to be a rabbi, to be a teacher, to be a leader. And so Jesus, waiting till 30, then begins now to pick his disciples. And he gives his disciples an invitation. And in, here in John 1, again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. John, yeah, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the one who was birthed in order to make a way for Jesus to come to the earth. In other words, to go out and preach before Jesus came to preach that people needed to repent and turn from their sins and baptize them. And that was the ministry of John the Baptist. Make straight the way of the Lord to bring Christ through. Jesus is coming. Get ready for the coming of the Messiah. You know, you all wicked sinners on earth. And that was John's message. And you need to repent. The Bible says he was like a voice crying in the wilderness. Repent! Make, way to, make straight the path of the Lord. And so here is John who was born to make a way, getting out of the way. He's standing on a street corner and Jesus walks by. And as Jesus, and looking at Jesus as he walked by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, John said to his two disciples that were with him, There's the Lamb of God. Follow the Lamb of God. This is what I came to announce. Get with him. He's the Messiah. Follow the Lamb of God. So he who was sent to make a way moves out of the way and says, follow Jesus. And, and, the, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following him, said to, said to them, what do you seek? Why are you following me? What is it I can do for you boys? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, teacher, where are you staying? We're following you. We won't know where you live, where you stay. And he said to them, come and see, which is the same thing he's, he says to all of us. I need you, Jesus. He said, come and see. My life's a mess. I need, a, I need to be straightened out. What does he say to us? Come and see. Jesus is still inviting people. <laughs> come and see. And and, and they came and they saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Everybody say 4 o'clock. The Jews kept time in two terms. They were called, the nighttime hours were called watches and the daytime hour were called hours. The days went from 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock 
at, at night was the daytime hours, and 6 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock in the morning were the nighttime watches. So it's about the 10th hour. If you count that up, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's getting pretty late to be traveling around all over there. And so they stayed with Jesus. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon. Everybody say, that foul mouth fisherman? <laughs> Jesus wanted that foul mouth fisherman? That guy who couldn't control himself? The guy that was so bombastic that every time he spoke, he put his foot in his own mouth. Do you realize in the Gospels, everything Peter said is wrong? <laughs> except for one thing. You remember Peter said, this will never happen to you. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter said, said, all the rest of this bunch might leave you, but you can count on the rock. The rock will never leave you. And all he ever did was leave him. The only thing that Peter said right in the whole New Testament was when Jesus asked the question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him and said, You finally got something right, Peter. <laughs> and this is what he said in a very polite way. He says, For, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but the, but, the, but the Spirit, but my Father which is in heaven, which is a nice way of saying... Peter, you finally uh, uh, let the Spirit speak to you before your flesh spoke to you, and you kept your mouth shut long enough for the Spirit to speak instead of your flesh. Congratulations. You finally got something right. So Andrew finds foul mouth Peter and says, We have found the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be Cephas, which is translated to stone. And, and, and I want you to just make a mental note in your head here, in your heart, about what Jesus sees in all of us. Because we are so easily enamored with the package. We're so e easily enamored and obsessed with, 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 with the box and, and that we can miss the miracle. We can miss the potential of that on the inside. I mean, some people can be so brazen that we'll miss the potential because we're so turned off by the presentation and they're, they don't have a good heart and they don't have a good attitude and they're grouchy and they... They're not, you know, attractive enough, and uh, and we can get so enamored with with with, with the with the with the with the, the 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 package that we miss the potential, yeah, yeah. and we don't look at them like God looks at them. And Peter, Jesus looks at Peter, foul mouth Peter, problem Peter, and Jesus says, "Your name is Simon. Do you know what the name Simon means? Snub nose." Your name is, you know, Snubby. Uh, yeah. He probably had a stub nose. That's why he probably said that, like that permanently turned up nose. That said to everybody, I'm just a little bit better than you. It also means hearing one. So I don't know what his parents had in mind, but it means both of those things. So Jesus says, you're no longer, you know, I look at you and I don't see Snubby. <laughs> I look at you and I don't see uh, a potential problem in, in my ministry. I look at you and I see that God can use you better than anybody else because of your courage and your boldness and because you're willing to step out where others won't step out, Peter. And so I'm changing your name to reflect a new potential for you and you're no longer going to be called Snubby. You're going to be my rock. That's what you're going to be. And so Jesus invites his men Every one of these are invitations to join him. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said, follow me. These are Jesus' boys. These are his posse. These are the guys that are going to change the world. These are the guys that are going to head out and start an evangelistic ministry like the world has never seen before. Here's a group of guys. These are the ones. These are the apostles, guys. These are the ones who are going to announce the Messiah and the King. And the, I mean, you're the Son of God. You're the, the Savior of the world. You're the Messiah. You're to be worshipped and adored. And here Jesus is calling his guys inviting them to come be a part and come follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and most likely the sons of Thunder, James and John. 
They did a lot of hanging around together, which they became disciples also. Philip found Nathanael. Look at what happens with Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also in the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And look at what Nathanael does. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? So the first thing Nathanael does is insult Jesus' hometown. This is Jesus by dissing his hometown. Can he come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Again, Jesus could have rejected based on the package. I don't like him. Anybody that doesn't have enough sense not to uh, diss somebody's hometown before you even meet him. I don't want some crude fellow like that in my posse. But Jesus not getting all caught up in the package, but knowing the potential of these guys. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And on the third day, oh, wait, let me just stop right there because I want to I just stop for a second. So here are the men. Here's the posse. Here are the invited ones, and everything's ready. Jesus has spent his, his, his weeks and months preparing them for what was coming, uh, he, he got them together and he gave them the pep talk. Okay, guys, we're going out there and we're going to fight a good fight. All right, guys, we're going out there and there might be some things that happen out there that are going to surprise you. We're going out there and, and I'm telling you, the, you know, all of the people are not going to like us and some of the people are going to reject us and they're going to accuse us of things and they're going to try to kill us and they're... I mean, this is going to be a hard ministry, but I'm going to tell you guys, hang in there because, because you're filled with the Spirit of God and you're prepared in the invitation. Okay, are we ready to go out? And you can see almost like a locker room scene where they're jumping up and down in the circle, you know. Are we ready to go? We're ready to play. We're ready to fight. All right, we're ready to conquer the world. We got the message of God. One, let's two, let's go now. One, two, three, go! And as they go out of the locker room, the very next thing that happens is on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I'm not, this is a very surprising thing is what I want you to see. A surprising thing. Not that Jesus would be at a wedding. I mean, it's not surprising that Jesus would go to a wedding. I'm just surprised that at the moment he went to the wedding that he would take the time to go to a wedding. Especially, I mean, he's not even officiating the wedding. He's not marrying the young couple. He's just there at the wedding. And these are not unique people. As a matter of fact, the Bible doesn't even tell us who they are. So here's a no-name couple and a little place called Cana, Cana of Galilee, a little small city in Galilee, an insignificant little place. As a matter of fact, if you went to Israel today and you asked your tour guide or your cab driver to take you to Cana, they would take you to a little wide spot in the road and they would say to you, we think this is where Cana was. Because Cana no longer exists. Because Cana was nothing to start with. It was just a wide spot in the road. So here's Jesus on the brink of a world tour like the world has never seen. A big evangelistic campaign that is going to change the world that we live in. And all of his guys are pumped and psyched and ready to go. And so they step out the door and Jesus says, hey, wait a minute, guys. Before we get started in this world tour, we got to go down here to this little wedding down here. And probably one of his guys said, Jesus, why in the world would we go to a wedding? He said, well, mom's there and I RSVP, and so we got to go. <laughs> I mean, mom went to the wedding, and I made the mistake of saying, okay, I'll be there. And, uh, and so now, you know, <laughs> mom's there and expecting me, and I, I got to go down and at least say goodbye to her. You know, I can't just leave without saying, mom, I'm leaving now for the world tour uh, thank you for everything you've done and bless his mom and give her a hug and kiss her and say goodbye and I'll see you at the cross, really. So it's surprising 
that Jesus would do this at this particular time, which makes me look at it in a little different light. Why did Jesus do this? Why was Jesus even there? Why, why would Jesus be at a, at a, at a no-name wedding, at a no-name place, at a critical time of life, performing a miracle? Well, let me just read the rest, and, and I'll come back and do some verses for you. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said, They have no wine. And he said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Mine hour is not yet come. That's kind of an abrupt answer, isn't it, really? That, that's really an awkward answer. It makes you nervous, doesn't it? I mean, really, you, when, you, when we read that, you go, he was, he was not polite to his mom. That's a, that's not the, that's not a, that, that makes me uncomfortable to see Jesus acting like that. Okay, me too. <clears throat> There's a reason, though, you'll see. And his, and, and, and his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of the purification of the Jews. In other words, these pots that were sitting at the wedding were sitting out there in the open, and they were just common pots. There was nothing special about them. They weren't there for any ceremonial reason. They were just there because these are the kind of water pots that they used every day. And so everybody walked by these water pots without even noticing the water pots. They were very common. And, and so there were set six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purification of Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Everybody say big pots. Big pots. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. He said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And I don't know how it got cut off, but there's some other stuff there. And they took, the, took it to the master of the feast. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew... The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good stuff, and when the guests have well drunk, uh, then he brings out the cheap stuff. Uh, you've, but you've kept the good wine until now. Notice this last verse, though. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This was, this was a tremendous miracle. This was the first miracle that Jesus ever did. This was the first time anybody ever saw the miraculous power of God on this earth. And it was done at a tiny little wedding in a no-name place with a no-name couple at an inopportune time. And Jesus showed forth his glory and manifested himself that he was who he said he was. And I'm just saying, I'm just asking the question, inquiring minds want to know why. You know, of course, being a Baptist by, by, by birth and a Baptist through the years, I know if you're, some of you are shocked, you shouldn't be, but, but that's what I've been all my life, pastor of Baptist churches all my life. No, we're not, we're not a Baptist church. We're an, an independent church. We're not associated with a denomination. We're Christians and not implying that they're not, so don't get all whapped up about that. I'm just saying we haven't identified as a denomination, but I've grown up as a Baptist all my life, and if you know anything about Baptists, you know one thing. They're teetotalers, right? Alcohol is out. And dancing and alcohol. They don't have to worry about me dancing because I can't dance. I have trouble with that. I, I can dance. I'm just rhythmically challenged. I just, you know, maybe you are too. So they don't have to worry about me dancing, but this wine thing, um, you know, this wine thing is unique because they believe that, of course, the, the wine that was created here was not actually fermented uh, alcoholic wine that it somehow was uh, the best grade of, I guess, grape juice that you could possibly perform, you know. But I know it had some potency to it. 
I know it was the real deal. You know why? Because the verses say that it did. The verses say that the normal function of the bar at a wedding was to be open with the best stuff being served first, the, power, the more powerful, the better tasting stuff, the stuff that people would prefer be first, and after people got a little tipsy and they're walking around with a red solo cup, <laughs> that then you put that old cheap stuff out there because by the time they get to that point, they can't tell the difference between the good stuff and the cheap stuff. Right. And here's Jesus at a wedding where the central event of the wedding is, and they ran out of wine. <laughs> where the most noted thing about the wedding was not who the bride and groom were, not how the ceremony went, not how everybody enjoyed it and it was a wonderful wedding and they had a great time dancing and, and all of that. The central thought of the wedding that Jesus postponed for a number of hours, the, 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 the evangelistic rally and crusade of the existence of the world the most noted thing that happened there was, and they ran out of wine. I feel nervous even talking about it. <laughs> my, guilt, my guilt runs so deep. It's a, thing, it's a bad thing. So in order for me to tell you why this happened, you're going to have to come back next week. <laughs> Is this not the greatest cliffhanger ever? Because I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot to say about it. And there's a lot in these verses, every single one of them, to say to us about an invitation from God. Seriously, there is a reason why this happened. And everything in this tells you the reason why it happened. And I can't just, I, I mean, it's 1137. It's time to walk out the door. And I got about 45 minutes more worth of stuff here. <laughs> So I'm not fixing to just hurry through the good stuff. All that other stuff is just kind of leading you up to the point where you can see why this would happen. You see, the Christmas, the, that Christmas is about an invitation. And, and, and I know on the website, Tanya, last night, she said, what can I, uh, give me a sentence. Give me a sentence that I can put on our website so that if people read it, they will know what the message is going to be about. Just, just like in one sentence. And I said, uh, put this on there. Um, have you invited Christ into your Christmas this season? Have you invited him into your Christmas this season? God invites you. Have you invited him? This is a good word. We'll, we'll look at it next Sunday morning. But so far, so far, God has invited the world to come join him. God took a little piece of heaven called the Word. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. God took Jesus and took a little piece of heaven and set it down on earth and said, now earth, this is what heaven is like. Come join me. Come and see. Jesus called his men. Jesus calls us. Come and see. Have you invited him in to your house, to your life this Christmas season?